Welcome to Making Therapy Better, the podcast that brings together some of the top minds in psychotherapy as well as everyday clinicians to talk about where the field is headed and how we can achieve better mental health care for everyone. Making Therapy Better is hosted by Professor Bruce Wampold, who has dedicated his career to understanding how therapy works and advocating evidence-based methods for improving outcomes. His guest today is Professor George Silberschatz. George is a licensed psychologist in San Francisco and has been practicing, teaching, and doing research on psychotherapy for over 40 years. He is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California San Francisco School of Medicine, a past president of the North American chapter of the Society for Psychotherapy Research, and a past president of the International Society for Psychotherapy Research. He is also the editor of the book Transformative Relationships, The Control Mastery Theory of Psychotherapy. Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths. CarePaths has been helping in-person and virtual therapy practices thrive for over 20 years with their complete web-based EHR and practice management platform. As mental health care evolves, CarePaths is leading the way in making measurement-based care easy and cost-effective for therapists. Visit carepaths.com to sign up for a free trial today. And now, without further ado, Episode 5 of Making Therapy Better... Case Formulation and Flexibility with Professor George Silberschatz. So, George, this is a great opportunity to have a conversation with you. We've had several over the years and want to get your perspective on the field, um, where we've been, uh, where we are, but most importantly, what's the future and what are the challenges for psychotherapy? So, you know, as I look at your career, George, you're one of those people who really has epitomized science and practice. You have a practice. Um, uh, you've published a number of articles. We're going to talk about uh, two of the areas, particularly during the interview, as well as teaching trainees. So you've seen it um, from various perspectives. Given that, what's your kind of a broad picture where we are today in terms of where psychotherapy fits into the healthcare system? Um, maybe some about the future, but just broad strokes. What do you think mm -hmm. about where we are? Well, thank you, Bruce. I, um, I think the first thing I would say is I think it's unfortunate that the kind of bifurcation between uh, practitioners and researchers, I mean, that, that gap I suppose, has been there in one way or another for a long time. But I think it's widened a mm. lot right now. And I think that's unfortunate for both the science side of psychotherapy and the practice side of psychotherapy. And um, I mean, I, when I was in graduate school, you know, in the 1970s, I mean, a little bit of that was already happening. And I had one foot, I don't know how I came to that, but I had one foot in both worlds. I mean, I went, I was fortunate to go to an incredible graduate program at NYU. And even during my days, there were the people that were in the clinic, so to speak, and mm -hmm. the people that were at the research center for mental health. And I was lucky to be comfortable in both of those arenas. I loved psychotherapy. I loved what was happening in the clinic. But I was also very excited about what was going on uh, at the research center. And that's kind of how it's been for me for, for a long time, for, for my whole career. And um, I wish there were a way to bring some of that back because the current, I mean, at least the current PhD programs, well, there's the PhD side D kind of bifurcation, but most of the PhD programs that I know of uh, are are purely research, and the, the faculty in those programs, you know, have not seen a client or a patient since their graduate school days, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's good for our field. Yeah, so you're talking about 
some of the clinical psychology programs, yes. particularly at major research universities, Correct. are really focused on um, research and maybe not even research related to psychotherapy. Could be experimental right. psychopathology or neuroscience. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, George, for. I was just going to say, when I got my first big um, NIMH grant, I, I went to school at NYU. I came back to Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco, and I was working with people that had been doing, that were practitioners and researchers, Hal Sampson and Joe Weiss. And they, um, and when I got my first research grant of my own from NIMH, I was tempted to just close up my practice. And Hal Sampson advice, said to me, don't do it. It was the best advice I've ever mm. got. Because he said, the research will, the, 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 the practice, the doing psychotherapy will keep your research honest. And mm. the research will keep your practice honest. And that's been true. That's been very true. Well, let's talk about uh, both of those directions, because I think it's important. You know, when we talk about the scientist-practitioner model, um, people often make the comment, well, clinicians don't read the research. They're not really informed by the research. But you're really mm -hmm. talking about the research being um, more applicable. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about this that the research really isn't as relevant or as important as it should be because the people doing it are not, do, are not doing clinical practice. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. And I mean, this, this won't surprise you, Bruce, but, you know, I think part, uh, I think part of the problem with the research and part of the reason that a lot of clinicians aren't reading much research is the, 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 the track that we've taken for so long toward clinical trials. And I think that most, most of the research on clinical trials just doesn't affect people's practice. It's just mm -hmm. divorced from mm -hmm. the reality of what people are dealing with. But that, that for me, of course, that's never been what research is all about. I mean, one can do research on very fundamental processes about psychotherapy and that kind of research is very very interesting to clinicians mm -hmm. well let's get to that point um uh in a few minutes because i think it's really important and the research you've done has been very much focused on the processes of psychotherapy mm -hmm. and how that's related to outcome but let's talk about this issue about clinical trials, because in medicine, clinical trials uh, are at the very heart of um, the research world and have, um, I think, fairly profound implications for clinicians. Why is it the, the same in psychotherapy? I think there are assumptions that, that have to be made in clinical trials that just don't apply well to what we deal with as psychotherapy. So mm. in medicine, I mean, one I'm thinking of is the homogeneity assumption, right? That people, mm. if you're studying a particular treatment for whatever particular kind of cancer, you can assume, I mean, even in medicine, there are difficulties with that, but let's put that aside for the moment. And let's assume that if you've identified particular kinds of cancers, you have a relatively homogeneous group of patients and you can make, you can generalize from those. Mm -hmm. In psychotherapy, we have a much more complex uh, issue that we're dealing with that when we, you know, we, we talk about identifying a group of, of depressed patients, for example, but th those patients are not homogeneous. They are, I mean, they may share certain kinds of symptoms, but they come to that in very, very different ways. And mm. I think that's one of the fundamental problems with 
clinical trials in, in psychotherapy. And similarly, you want to talk about homogeneity of the treatments, as you know better than, than most, um, though that's a, a very, very flawed assumption about uh, treatments as well. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of it this way, and it's actually, I got this from, from Zach Elm a little bit, but when a clinical trial shows that a particular medication is effective for a particular disease, the medication uh, administered by a clinician is pretty standardized and very close to what's done in the clinical trial. Yes. I mean, uh, 10 milligrams of drug X uh, is 10 milligrams of drug X. Yeah. In psychotherapy, that's not the case. Right. I mean, they even in clinical trials, if you were to watch the videotapes, which both of us have done, there's quite a variation among therapists within therapists with different patients. Yes. I mean, what is what is CBT is not some uh, formula, something you can get in a formula. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think the I think the study, one of the studies that you've published and written about is how therapist effects trump treatment effects. Mm -hmm. That's a big yeah. problem for clinical trials. Yeah. You know, we don't want to say this too loud, but it's not uh unheard of in medicine as well. Uh, yeah, yes, it, I mean that was you know, true. Yes, in the yeah. NIMH collaborative study, yes, the, the psychiatrists giving the treatment had a bigger yeah. impact than the, than the drug. But not just in mental health treatments, but in, in physical health treatments. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's a discussion for another day. So, right. So as um, long as we're on clinical trials, I think we should mention that the screening of the patients the inclusion and exclusion criteria yes. often make the patients different than we see in clinical practice. Right. I mean, in depression trials, when we screen out people with suicidal ideation, um, maybe some uh, psychotic features uh, using, using uh, uh, psychotropic medication, we do all of these things. Um, they no longer look like the patients that are going to present to the clinic. Right, or, or take a trial on eating disorders, where mm. you say the person has to have an eating disorder with no comorbid conditions. Yeah. Show me such a patient, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So, George, let's take that as a starting point to talk about um, the research that is done in psychotherapy that you think is applicable to clinical practice and kind of get into the process research, but discuss what you think is, is important research that has been done or that we should be doing that really would be important for clinicians mm -hmm. um, to understand. So, the thing that I hear most from clinicians is what I would like to know from research is when I'm working with a particular patient, what's going to be most helpful to that? How can I help that patient most effectively? And that's, that's the kind of research that I think clinicians would pay a great deal of attention to. And we try to approximate that in a lot of psychotherapy research that we do, partly through clinical trials, partly through other aggregation kind of things and so on. But it, for most clinicians, it kind of that kind of aggregation, particularly like in meta-analyses, is sort of misses the mark of what they're mm. really wanting to know from researchers. Like when I when I see a person who has complicated grief and they have uh they're just not able to overcome their grief what what's a way of thinking about that that would help me as a clinician help my patient more mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that's easy i mean that that would be a challenge for for the research community to really deal with um in a you know in a very useful way but i think it's important to start with what would clinicians find 
helpful. And I think that's the kind of thing that, um, so we've tried to do that with case formulation, you know, that if you can come up with a way of understanding something about who is this particular person that you are trying to help and what do you know about this person, the more you know about that, the more you can be helpful to that person. But, you know, that's that's tough. That's a slog. But yeah, it's well, let's get, we'll also get to case formulations because I'm I'm eager to talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. So, George, you talked about uh, um, what would be useful to the clinician. I kind of went through a thought experiment in my mind. If we ask clinicians, write down 10 things from seeing patients today that would be helpful for you. And we took those and gave them to a researcher like me. It would be a very tall order to do that research. It's it's a challenge um, to, to think about mm -hmm. how you might design and conduct research that would be um, answer those questions. Mm -hmm. So I agree. But it's it's um, <laughs> there's some things that are really hard, but they're still worthwhile aiming for. That's that's mm -hmm. what I would. It, it it you know that old joke about the drunk person that is go going to look for his keys for the car and he's looking under the light and someone says, "Well, why are you looking here?" And said, "Well, this is where the light is." Yeah. And you yeah. know, I think it's not where the keys are, but that's where the light is. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's uh we we tend to do a lot of, and look, I mean, I've probably done my share of that as well cuz sometimes you go for the low-lying fruit. I get it. But <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't lose yeah. sight of <laughs> Well, we're not we're, we won't get into that. And too much detail about the research that we've produced that that hasn't had much impact right. but you know i think there are um if you look at the research and you know what's interesting george just to slow down for a minute when uh i present to clinicians and i talk about the implications of research often I, we both get the feeling well, we already knew that. <laughs> Where we so are what? We already knew it. The clinicians oh, wow. say, uh -huh. well, that, that's pr pretty obvious. So uh, a couple of examples. When I talk about the variability in outcomes among therapists, um, I usually do the introduction. Of course, patients know this. They know that all therapists giving treatment X are not alike. Um, uh, clinicians know this, and uh, uh, so it's some of what we discover in our psychotherapy research is pretty well known, mm -hmm. but sometimes not so much. Mm -hmm. So I think about the research on affect in psychotherapy and its importance, and particularly in the moment to moment interaction of attending to the affect and its importance, and not in just in psychodynamic or emotion-focused therapy, but also in, in cognitive and behavioral therapies. Mm -hmm. And I think that research is informative. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Anderson's work on facilitative interpersonal skills um, has, uh, I think, profound implications for practice. Yes, I I certainly agree with you about Anderson's work. And I think in, in a way that, that's the kind of thing that probably makes intuitive sense to clinicians, that there are people that are just good at helping people talk or helping people to get it, you know, feel comfortable. And mm -hmm. if, to the extent that researchers can identify what are those facilitative skills that would help in selecting therapists. It would help in training therapists. Yeah. I think it would make for more effective psychotherapy. So I think that is an area of research that has a lot has a lot going for it, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, George, this is raising the issue because we're talking about 
um, uh, really moment to moment uh, uh, aspects of the therapeutic endeavor that are important for outcomes. So, as we've discussed, you know there there's many in the field who are focused on on treatments. Uh, uh, you know, which is the the most effective treatment for a particular disorder or for a particular type of patients with a particular disorder. And then there are those who are quite focused on, on relationship variables. How do you see the, those, the tension between uh, um, kind of relationship uh, process-oriented um, dynamics of therapy and the treatment that you're actually delivering. How do how do they work together? Um, yeah, I just leave it. Yeah, well, I, I should just to start with my own bias, which I I mean I teach psychiatry residents, and basically I start out I teach a year long class on psychotherapy, and I I start out the class by saying learn whatever technique you want. Learn whatever technique, I mean, this is in terms of what you were calling the treatment. So learn a particular technique or two that is comfortable for you, whether it's psychodynamic or CBT or emotion or any number of different approaches. Learn one that makes sense to you and that it feels comfortable. But then be aware that now you have to contact whatever technique it is, you have to contextualize it to the patient. You can't, it's not prescriptive. And this is where their background in med, where it's very different from your medical training. It doesn't work that way in psychotherapy. You can't be prescriptive about it. You have to contextualize it to the particular patient that you're, that's in front of you and what that particular patient needs and what they're trying to accomplish. And if you can, so if you can do those, so the contextualizing may come closer to what you were calling the relationship end of things. And, and the technique that they're learning is more the treatment, but it's like you have to find a way of, of blending. If you just have a particular treatment, and I see plenty of people like this, this is what I do. I do exposure mm -hmm. therapy. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the the dropout rate in the VA for exposure therapy is enormous. Yeah. Yeah. But there's still people, that's what they do. That that's an example of an uncontextualized treatment. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, those are less than optimal. I was gonna say mm -hmm. useless, if not harmful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um well, we've looked at the data, we know it can be harmful. Yes. Um, but say more about what are the aspects of this contextualization? So as a therapist, um, let's say I'm a CBT therapist. I know uh, exposure treatments. I know uh, uh, some cognitive restructuring uh, uh, techniques. As I uh, um, deliver these techniques or these treatments, what should I pay attention to? And how should I massage that technique in order to be most effective. Mm -hmm. Let me take a simpler example first of uh, let's uh, let's take a CBT technique and the emphasis on homework, okay? So let's say you have a patient who has been very driven and very compulsive and they've always, you know, they're these overachievers. They've mm -hmm. always done not only the homework in the course of their schooling, they've done way more and have yeah. spent way more time doing it. So let's say that patient comes in and you assign some homework thing and they come in and they've done it, they've done it diligently. But now after a few sessions, they're experimenting with something different. They're experimenting with, oh, I, I forgot to do, I didn't do the homework this week. Mm. Mm. Now, with that patient, okay, instead of focusing on that as a problem, mm. that should be seen as an achievement. Yeah. And that's what, that's what I mean by contextualizing. Mm. On the other hand, if you had a different patient who was always a slacker, and who, who came up in a family where nobody really cared whether they were doing their homework or not. 
And then that patient says something like, I, I didn't do my homework. Well, then you need to have a different conversation with that patient mm -hmm. about what. So th th this is what I mean by contextualizing it mm -hmm. to the particulars of the of mm -hmm. the case. And I think that's what's not I, I don't think our field pays enough attention to that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great example, George, of, of contextualizing um, the act of not doing homework based on really the case formulation or yes, knowledge the, about, about the patient right. as being important. Is this something we could do in a prescriptive way? I mean, is it uh, we could talk about rules for um, contextualizing homework assignment compliance. I, I think not only could it could homework, but I think everything about a technique could be. I mean, that's what we should aim for. I'm not saying it's easy. Could and should be contextualized. And so, one of the reasons we focus on our work a lot on case formulation is that that becomes a way, a a, a basis for that kind of tweaking and mm. contextualizing to what the person needs. Now, there, there are other people in the field, not in psychotherapy, but there's a whole field that I learned about. I never even knew it existed called relationship science. Mm. And it's not clinical. It's just about mm. people relating. And there's a guy, Harry Reese, who's done a lot of research, a huge amount of research on this. And he talks about... Um, Partner perceived responsiveness mm -hmm. versus actor intended responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the a lot of the technique and the treatments that we do are kind of fall in that in that realm of actor intended responsiveness. But what it's missing is the partner perceived response. When I talk about contextualizing, I'm really addressing how's the partner going to perceive that. What, what you're intending as responsive and helpful, how is the partner going to, your patient in this case, going to perceive that? And in Reese's work, he's shown in so many different huge studies that it's partner perceived responsiveness is the only thing that matters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, empathic response is not therapeutic if it's not perceived exactly. to be therapeutic. Exactly. But, you, but you're really saying to understand how to construct a response for a therapist, you have to have an intimate knowledge of the patient sitting across from you. Yes. Or even, even a rudimentary knowledge will go a long way. <laughs> a knowledge beyond the diagnosis is what I'm yeah. saying. Because the yeah. diagnosis is useless, in my opinion. Absolutely mm -hmm. useless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, George, the case formulation has come up a couple of times, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to, to make sure we have enough time to discuss that because, mm -hmm. you know, much of your work has been around how to construct and more importantly, use case formulations right. to improve psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So... What is the case formulation and what are the necessary components to make it actually uh, actionable and useful? Yeah, yeah. so uh, our, our research group has thought about this for a, a very, very long time and, and worked on it in all kinds of different ways. And when I think about it, I mean, this will sound, may sound strange without explanation, but I now, I now talk about it as a personalized case mm -hmm. formulation because it turns out when you really dig into it that all case formulations are not personalized there are mm -hmm. plenty of case formulations that come top down from theory they're saying mm -hmm. oh this patient has a you know a patient who has a particular issue with going off to college and they're focusing on that um, they don't kiss their mothers anymore goodbye, and the mother has a problem. So a, a, a top-down, oh, well, this is the person's unresolved Oedipal issue with the mother. Mm. Well, that may have nothing to do with the, it's. It's interesting at a broad level, but it may have nothing to do with what this young person's problem with going away to college is. 
And so there are these there are these top down sort of gen, more generic case formulations. So I think I talk about personalized case formulations where you have to focus. So we've developed ways of trying to triangulate on that because it's not easy. But mm. we focus on on basically these components about what are the when the person's coming to see you, what are their adaptive goals? In other words, what do they want in mm. coming to therapy? And then the second thing is, well, what's getting in their way? Why aren't they able to achieve what they want? Mm -hmm. And we think of what's getting in their way as a broad kind of, we talk about it as a pathogenic schema. And that, where does that come from? We don't come into the world with pathogenic schemas. So we try to think about, from the interview, we try to think about well, what are the kind of adverse experiences that gave rise to those kinds of pathogenic schemas. And the last category is what kinds of experiences or how is the patient going to work to change those in the therapy? So that's just a heuristic tool for trying to hone in on a, mm. on a, you know, what's important for this particular patient. And I can give you this really simple example that I use in, in teaching all the time of um, this happens to come from a psychoanalytic case that we studied very intensively. But this was um, a patient who came to she sought out a Freudian analyst because she fought with her husband a lot. She loved her husband, but she wanted to understand why she fought with him. And that's why she came for analysis. So that's what was on her agenda. She chose a Freudian analyst, and she knew that this analyst is interested in dreams. Okay? So we come to the fifth session. of the, This is the fifth session that they've met, and she starts out like this. I had an interesting dream last night. And then there's a pause. I also had a fight with my husband. Which would you like me to talk about? She says. Okay, now this is an interesting, this is an interesting moment. Now, I can tell you a few simple, this, is, this will show you what I mean by a very rudimentary formulation. What the patient had talked about in previous sessions was this, that she grew up in a family with a very, very narcissistic father and a very passive mother. How narcissist, you know, the father would insist that the children wear the clothes that he liked and eat the foods that he liked. And if they didn't do that, he was sullen and quiet and withdrawn. So that's an adverse experience, right? It's a, we would call that a traumatic kind of experience, growing up in that kind of family. The person to, 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 uh, to survive in that kind, to maintain a relationship with a parent, which is so important, you know, to preserve your attachment, you need your parents. Yeah. She develops a pathogen, what was at that time an adaptive schema, but it turns out to be pathogenic. The schema is to get along with someone, you have to subjugate yourself to their needs. Okay, so this is very rudimentary, but this is all material that you had talked about in the previous sessions. Now, if you know just those things, about the patient. You know that she has this pathogenic schema. I need to subjugate myself in order to get along with you. And she says, which would you like me to talk about? Mm -hmm. right? yeah. That's a, she's, she's setting that up. Yeah. And there is a helpful intervention in that. The, 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 that rudimentary formulation gives you immediate guidance in terms of what would be helpful for this patient. I think you should talk about whatever is important to you. She would love that. Now, that's not going to cure her, of course, but that would be very, in terms of building relationship, that would be very helpful to her. But here's the hook, Bruce, that people could say, and they've said this to me in trainings that I've done, well, that would be helpful for anybody. Talk about whatever you want. The truth is, it's not helpful to anybody, because if you imagine a different patient who grew up in a family that where she got no guidance, where she needed things from her parents when she was very little, and the parents said things, we don't know what to do, why don't you figure it out? Yeah. That yeah. Patient, a patient who grew up in that kind of context would hear a therapist saying, I think you should talk about whatever you want to talk about as further indication that this is another person who's not going to be able to help me with what I need, who can't give me what I need. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I mean by contextualizing. Yeah, a great example about how the case formulation is really important in guiding the therapist in that moment. Yes. About how to respond. Right. So it isn't just about, well, what kinds of treatment should I apply or how should I structure treatment, but in a moment to moment interaction. Yes, yes. And from my point of view, it wouldn't matter what the, I mean, th this could be a cognitive therapist. It wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. It could be, a, it mm -hmm. could be an EFT therapist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th it would apply across therapies. There's two points about this I want to discuss about the case formulation. Um, uh, the second, which we'll discuss in a minute, is around, is it a static thing that can be done before uh -huh. therapy starts, or how does it evolve over the course of therapy? Yeah. But before we get to that, I want to discuss this theoretical orientation, because when you describe what's in a case formulation, part of it reminded me of, of uh, CBT, this maladaptive core schema, mm -hmm. which is related to the, to the core schema in CBT. Mm -hmm. But the experiences, well, sounded a little more psychodynamic, but, you know, behavior therapists want a learning history as well. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, the trans-theoretical nature of the way you see case formulations. So what, what I say is that this... I mean, there is some theory, obviously, that that shapes those categories, uh, and I'm very explicit about that. But what, what I say about it is that it begins with basic Darwinian biology, that we, all living things, are wired by evolution to adapt to their environment. It's like so Darwin said, you either adapt or die. Those are the choices. Yeah. So yeah. adaptation is a central piece that guides this, and that's and that's what I mean when I say that when in that in that example I gave you, when you grow up in a family with a very narcissistic parent, for example, it's very adaptive for you. You have to yeah. be able to subjugate yourself in order to preserve the the, the attachment is central. You know, survival depends yeah. on. Yeah. And so you do what you have to do to preserve that attachment. And, and Bowlby, of course, talked about, I mean, he's the most well-known person that talked about this in attachment theory. Um, and so, you know, Bowlby used the concept of internal working models. But yeah. it, so, and, you know, was Bowlby psychodynamic? And I mean, I think of it as, I, I think it's pretty basic. And that's why I like to start with Darwin. It's, it's about mm. adaptation. Mm -hmm. And then what what evolves through that through the efforts at adaptation that gets that gets more more complicated. But I I do think that it is a trans theoretical kind of th this broad category of for, for me. You have to accept a few things in order to really make it trans theoretical. One is you have to accept that people have adaptive goals. You have to accept that there are things that get in the way of those goals. That what one of the things that that is is some kind of schema, internal model, whatever you want to call it, and that people are motivated to change that. I mean, if mm -hmm. if, if you accept those three things, it, it can apply uh, across across theories. And the, the term schema, you know, I just want to say one thing about that. I mean, I know it's been appropriated by Jeff Young or CBT, but if you do the history, you know, this goes back to Kant, you know, yeah. or to Bartlett in 1932 wrote about schemes. Yeah. So, you know, people yeah. repackage things. Um, but George, at the, at the broadest level, the way you just, at the broadest level, yeah. the way you describe the three important features of the case formulation sound very trans-theoretical. Yeah, I think so. But to a CBT therapist, I'll just push back a little bit. Mm -hmm, well, sure. this early childhood experiences, we don't need to really dwell on that or even think about that in terms of um, 
designing and personalizing a CBT intervention. Mm -hmm. So when you work with CBT therapist, how does that play out? Some like it and and some don't. Some say yeah. we, don't, we we just work with what the uh, what the distorted beliefs are and we don't need mm -hmm. to know where they come from. And mm -hmm. I guess my attitude about as well, if, uh, how's that working out for you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you know, if you look at, I, I mean, CBT does a wonderful job in uh, making claims that it is the most superior treatment uh, there is. But as we know from the research, that's not true. Mm. That most that, that there's very little evidence. I mean, this is preaching to the choir, Bruce, but there's very yeah. little evidence for the superiority of one over the other. So, you know, um I just think at a at a pragmatic level, it would help people get more better outcomes if they paid attention to those. Now, in saying that though, I don't Myself as a therapist, I don't necessarily harp on people's childhood things. I don't spend mm -hmm. all this time yeah. in therapy, but it, it it informs me in terms of how how I understand. It helps me walk in the patient's shoes. That's the easiest way to put it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, George, we know that there's a variation in outcomes among therapists of every orientation. Right. And so uh, I liked your comment. Well, how's that working for you? If if if, if your outcomes are are commendable, um, maybe there there's no need to think about case formulations in a right. different way than you are. But there's always room for improvement, and we need to understand for all therapists what we could do to improve. And yeah. being inflexible. Or, or not being sufficiently flexible is a better way to put it, is one of the things that holds back therapists yes. from achieving better outcomes, particularly with patients that don't fit into their model too well. Right. And we know dropout rates, both in clinical trials and in practice, are quite high. Yes. So, most people who drop out of psychotherapy do it after the first session. Yeah. And that's yeah. a failure to engage. Um, yeah, I think so. In, in therapy. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you said, you know, this understanding the patient is important for you. But often I find it's important for the patient to understand this. Mm -hmm. Just the, the, the statement about, you know, your passive acceptance of a uh, significant other was adaptive for you as a child. Mm -hmm. That that defense really helped for your survival. Yes. It's just no longer adaptive. Right. In all cases, in your adult life. Right. That's freeing for many patients to hear that. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I often will tell people that when I'm able to to get it that way, you know, can put it that concisely. And and I think you're right. People feel very, um, they do feel very freed by that. And they feel understood because mm -hmm. then they're not pathologized. Like, oh, wow, look at this weird thing that you've become. You know? Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's an important point because, you know, to be called submissive by your therapist uh, uh, just as an observation, it is is a, a harsh thing to hear. Yes, but but the understanding use the word understanding. The the therapist is communicating. I understand this. Uh, I wanted to say dynamic, but let's put it in a more uh, trans theoretical way. This this pattern. Yeah, I understand. Uh, how it came to be, and how it may be adaptive in many circumstances in your own life, but in these critical aspects, for instance, the relationship with your husband, mm -hmm. it's not. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, look, that might be, you know, when you were asking before about broad principles that uh, could be studied and taught. I mean that you you may be identifying one that that could be very useful 
just in terms of how that understanding is framed, rather than just saying to someone, you have problems of being submissive or passive, but really contextualizing it like that. Um, mm-hmm. That's something that could be studied, too, in terms of how, does mm-hmm. that go down better than just giving people that sort of diagnostic frame of, yeah, you have problems with submissiveness. Yeah. So, George, let's get into this part about uh, um, the the f- creating the case formulation. Yeah. So I'll just do a hypothetical. Sure. Suppose... Um, your patient, let's take this uh, submissive patient, um, goes to a clinician who's going to do an assessment and sends you this case formulation. Very sophisticated, very um, uh, uh, on the money, let's say. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's got the three components you talked about. Would that be as helpful as as having done it yourself? So could you get Mm -hmm. a case formulation that would be um, sufficient Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to personalize the treatment in the way you've been talking about? What's well, a very interesting question, Bruce, and I think it's, uh, it's an empirical question. That's one that could be studied, actually. Um, I think all things being equal, it probably, there are probably uh, individual differences in terms of the willingness of the, of the therapist to really take it in, how open they are to it. But putting that aside, I think that the answer is probably yes, that it would be it would be useful to a clinician to have that uh, mm-hmm. going forward. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm a little surprised by your answer, George, because I thought you might say something like, well, you know, the formulation really evolves over the course of therapy because I have some conjectures, yet the response or the report of the th- the patient really, yeah. really is is testing my belief in my formulation, and I need to be open to revise. Revision. Yes. So, yes, I do. I do believe. But let me just. Give, I'll give you. Let me contextualize where yeah. where this comes from. So, when we were doing our psychotherapy research studies, we were we needed to. You didn't have the luxury in psychotherapy of letting the formulation unfold over time because we needed a formulation early so that we could test interventions the therapist was making. We were testing the hypothesis that interventions that were in accord with the formulation Mm -hmm. were productive than those that weren't. So we had to have a formulation as a basis. You couldn't keep changing that because that would be, you know, that would be a statistical nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So for research, we had to do it from the first couple of sessions and then study the sessions following. In clinical work, particularly in longer therapies, you can't treat the formulation as a blueprint. It's like you develop this one-shot thing and then this is going to carry you. It will give you some insight and some uh, empathy for what a patient is struggling with. But then, yes, as in, as the work unfolds, that, that may expand or you may find mm-hmm. parts of the formulation that aren't quite right, that it wasn't really the narcissistic father, but the need to satisfy this passive mother or whatever it might be. Yeah. That would uh, that you have to be open to in terms of so it that's part of the schism by the way between research and practice that for research you have to make certain you have to do certain things that you wouldn't have to do if you were doing this just clinically. But you also learn something from doing that kind of uh, artificial situation yes. of the prepackage that that's useful. Yes, and because the the outcome of that study was that that uh, uh, formula consistent interventions were more effective. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So I have another question about this. Um, uh, to do a formulation, it might take two or three sessions. 
And during that time, um, you're really forsaking action in terms of assessment. And I've heard some people say that results in a lack of engagement. Uh, and that's why uh, um, patients drop out after the first or second session. Mm -hmm. That, oh, I got to tell this story again. The therapist mm -hmm. is sitting there taking notes. And I want to kind of uh, uh, contrast that with, um, you know, you know, Lee McCullough. Sure. And I often use one of her cases um, for illustrating various things. She confronts this particular patient within about one minute, 30 seconds, <laughs> and they're, they're working. So she hasn't uh, completed a case formulation. Yes, she's diving in in a very uh, uh, um, fundamental and, and uh, deep way. Um, so talk about this kind of uh, um, assessment, case formulation versus intervention in mm -hmm. the early stages. Mm -hmm. So in our, we learned a few things in the course of doing this research, because we recorded all these therapies and studied them very intensively and so on. And one of the things we learned is about doing an initial session with, so the way our, our research project was set up was a, a, a patient would come in and they would be seen by an independent clinical evaluator. And that evaluator would do the intake interview. And that was pretty thorough and it was fairly structured. So we learned something about what you can do in a 45 or 50 minute session that can be very useful. So one of the things, I mean, the, the interview would be broken up into, I mean, it wasn't rigid like this, but basically the, what the evaluator was aiming for is, so what's bringing the patient in now? What do they want mm -hmm. to help with? Talk about that. Talk about what kinds of, how have they dealt with it? How has it been in the past and so on? Okay, I've got that. Now, tell me a little bit about you as a person. Tell me about your family, your life, mm -hmm. growing up, and your relationships. Tell me about your relationships with your parents, with siblings. And the person starts talking. So let's say they only talk about their relationship with father. Then the interviewer will say, okay, tell me something about your relationship with your mother. Then, you know, be siblings. Then it would be like uh, in school, mm -hmm. developmentally, what were your relationship with friends like, romantic relationships, current relationships. So it's a lot about relationships. Now, it turns out that, like, you probably know Lester's work on the core conflictual. Yeah. He had that thing of the rap paradigm, the relationship anecdote paradigm. You can take a person, anyone off the street, and just sit them down and say, tell me something about an important relationship in your life. Tell me about what happened and what you wished would have happened. Okay, so they'll tell you about somebody, a partner of somebody at work. Mm -hmm. So then do then do the same thing. Say, okay, now tell me about a relationship like that, an episode like these are relationship episodes. I want to just have a clear sense about this particular episode. Then you say, now tell me about another episode with a now with a different person. Tell me one about your yes. your sibling, your brother, your, yes. your sister. Whatever. Now tell me one about your your uh, lover. I mean, one about your, so you could do this with four or five relationship episodes. And I believe that in most instances, not all, you will have enough data to understand something very fundamental about that mm -hmm. person. And mm -hmm. so that's one reason why it is possible if you, if you're, if you're hunting, we didn't use the, the rap paradigm in our intakes, but if in your mind as an interviewer, if you're really going after different relationships, you will see threads across mm -hmm. those relationships. And those can be very useful in terms of arriving at a, at a formulation. Now, having said that, because we're teaching this class, like a six-month class right now on, on doing this, and 
teaching the class made me realize in my own practice, I've had episodes where I've met with people and in, in the first session, I'm trying to get a sense of them and doing this. And then I realize, oh, I, I've blown it. Because for this person, I've missed something really fundamental. I've missed what they're here for. And they mm -hmm. don't want to be talking about their mother or their child. They want to talk about this important decision that they have to make right now. And if I'm focusing on, you know, all mm -hmm. these things, it's not help. Now, in my defense, I say, well, if I get this information, I can make a more informed we can have a more informed conversation about this decision. But for mm -hmm. some people, it, yeah. it the only thing that would work is what Lee McCullough did. Yeah. There are yeah. that is the case. And yeah. there are other people for whom if Lee McCullough did what she did with them, they'd run and never come back. So yeah, it's true. It's very it's true. specific. So uh we're coming towards the end, George. We could go on for another hour. But you're really talking about. Uh, a theme that has run through all of your comments, and that is flexibility, therapist flexibility, by knowing important things about the patient. Yes. So you have to make that decision early on in that first session of whether being more thorough in the assessment of relationships, for instance, is the way to go or we really have to get to this impending decision. And relationships may be important for making that decision, but that's got to be on hold for this particular patient. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I know it, it disturbs me when a therapist says, well, this is the way I work with all patients. Mm -hmm. I do X, Y, and Z in this order. And that's important. Yeah. That that bothers me. It's not, bothers that it, me not that it's not a good way of working, but that it's inflexible. Yes, yes. And there are plenty of therapists who are quite open about that and will say things like, and if you can't do that, then I'm not the therapist for you. Yeah, yeah. George, we are running out of time here. This has been just so, well, it's been a lot of fun for me, but so illuminating and informative. Um, you know, as an observation, I've read your research, I've talked to you at conferences, but the chance to talk to you for an hour and discuss these, these uh, issues has just been wonderful. Oh, thank you, Bruce. The feeling is mutual. I can tell you one quick story that uh, you, I may repeat it at this conference that you're going to be at on becoming a better therapist. But the um, when I was in, in uh, graduate school at NYU, I, I started out at Mount Zion as, uh, after my undergraduate. And then I, I went to New York to, for graduate training. But I always came back to Mount Zion because I had friends here and I was involved in the research in one way or another. And I had a, 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 per, a mentor, really. He's a very good friend now, Marshall Bush. And um, after my second year of um, being in graduate school, the, the program at NYU was you would go, you would start work seriously in doing psychotherapy after your second year. Prior to that, you were doing intakes and that kind. So a lot of my colleagues and Mount Zion at that time had a you know national reputation for all kinds. And so a lot of my fellow students said, "Hey, when you go back, ask them, ask them what what could, what should we do? What's going to make us good therapists?" So I come back and I'm having lunch with my friend Marshall, and I said, "So Marshall, I'm about to start doing psychotherapy. What what advice? What can you give me? Give give me something." To, put my, I can hang my hat on in terms of doing therapy. He's a very thoughtful guy. And he said, well, you want to figure out what the patient wants and how you can help them get there. If you can do that, you'll be a good therapist. Yeah. And, you know, it's so simple, but I mean, I, I, I come back to that after many, many years of doing this and it's, it's really good advice. It's really good advice. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Making Therapy Better is brought to you by CarePaths, 
CarePaths offers a complete behavioral health EHR and practice management software solution, including claims, billing, clinical notes and documents, scheduling, and teletherapy, all for one simple and affordable monthly price. CarePaths EHR is HIPAA compliant and ONC certified and can also support electronic prescribing for an additional fee. Their latest release, CarePaths Connect, includes automated measurement-based care and the ability to create a digital front door for your practice, as well as a free mobile app designed to increase patient engagement. If you're just starting your practice or are dissatisfied with your current EHR, go to carepaths.com to start your free trial today. To find out more about Bruce Wampold and his work as CarePaths Chief Clinical Officer, visit makingtherapybetter.com.